Welcome to Accelerate Your Wealth, a podcast by Rebecca Robertson, founder and director of Evolution Financial Planning. This series, we're focusing on female financial independence, looking towards a stronger financial future. Be sure to let us know your thoughts on the show, and please do connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram, or head over to www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk. So today we're going to be joined by Star Monroe, and we're going to be talking about coming back to me. So coming back and finding yourself and how all that links, all that links back to money and wealth. And she's going to be sharing a little bit about her journey and so much more to get you thinking about what things you could be putting in place and what things you need to be considering. And she even got me thinking in today's show. So it's going to be a great listen. So let me tell you a little bit more about Star. So the leading in midlife menopause field with a wealth of experience working closely with women over 32 years. She's dedicated much of her life studying human behavior and she's a certified psychotherapist, eating psychology coach, relationship coach, sex, love and dating coach, somatic body worker, dominatrix, oh yes, and retired showgirl. Um, she navigates her own dark, uh, her own dark night of soul, overcoming addictions, alcoholism, a severe, severe body hate, um, abusive relationships and bankruptcy blending her flamboyant life experiences a wealth of professional training she's established herself as a specialist in um, facilitating deep transformation and healing so that midlife women can break free from whatever is holding them back and creating a wild love affair with themselves and life and what I love about star is she is what you see is what you get and um it, she she lives this life it, she embodies it and she does it every day and I, you know, up respect for her for that. So let's get talking to the amazing Star Munro. Here she is in real life. Watch out and hold on to your hats. Uh, so I give her a drum roll. <laughs> the beautiful Star Munro. Which oh, thank you. <laughs> amazing to have you. So I should tell people I've known Star actually for about 11 years, I think now, may, maybe a little bit longer. And I came across her because I wanted uh, an au pair. Is that an au pair? No, that's like nanny, isn't it? Yeah. But don't want Com- 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 pair. Com- pair, not an au pair. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I have a head cold. I cannot think straight. Um, a compare for my event. I had a women's health and well-being event, a wealth event. Um, it was a big stage with a curtain. It was based in Kent. And I needed someone bigger than, than life itself to hold this space of all these women in this room. And I came across Star and I was like, well, she is definitely the girl to do this. Um, and as I see you today, it's like, yeah, you are the, the same person, but there's something sort of like this warm and softer mm-hmm. side of you is just sort of creeped out. And I've just loved seeing what you've got up, got up to in the last 11 odd years. So I can't wait for you to share some of that with my listeners. Yeah, well, I'm all yours. I will share everything and anything that you want me to, because it has been it has been a mega journey of coming back home to me. And I, I do remember, we were just saying just before we hit record, I, I do remember when I came to be your compare, not your au pair. <laughs> you would never be an au pair. Do you know what, though, a long time ago, I did want to be a nanny. I don't know why, but I, just, I can't see it. <laughs> no, I can't see it either. But I remember back then, like, I, I am different. I, yeah, I, I was so wrapped up in uh, the identities that I thought I had to take on to um, conquer the world. Um, and I'm not sure about you, but I came from a very stoic family. Um, and I, it's the more research and the understanding that I do, because I'm a trained psychotherapist and a master of life coach. Um, it's th- that generation in their 70s, that's where my mum and dad are, that... It, I'd, I've done a lot of healing. I love them dearly, but they were brought up by that stoicism before them. So that was injected into me from the very early age. So I wasn't allowed to be myself. Um, I can't even remember childhood really, but I was just taught to be a good girl, to sit there quietly. Um, and then I was just taught, I was, I 
I was the eldest of four of us, so I was taught to just fend, fend for myself. You couldn't express any emotions. You couldn't tell anyone how you felt. So um, I just went into life really emotionally illiterate and yeah. I made a shitload of mistakes that, you know, I left a trail of destruction, um, which included me going bankrupt um, because of that. And then that unraveling started probably just after I met you. Well, yeah, it started around the same time. Um, I got to the age of 40 and I looked back at my life and I, I would, yeah, I just looked back and I went, God, if I don't do something, if I don't change how I'm showing up in life, then the last half of my life is going to be really messy because at least I had youth on my side on my first half. Do you want me to tell you kind of some of the things yeah, that go for it. I you you quite- share? I, well, I love talking about these personas that you had and you recognize you had these personas. I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, all women do. I mean, this is what I do. I work, I've worked with women since I've been 19. Um, women will pick up personas, identities and masks to get through life. Um, and and the, the main ones, because I work with midlife women, are going to be people pleaser, good girl. Um, they're going, oh, you know, they could have picked up the bitch. They could have picked up the emotionally defensive. It's just, it's really interesting noticing all these masks. So for me, that there was a trail of destruction. Like I never really liked myself. I had severe body hate. I had eating disorders when I was in my teens. Um, I have been married and divorced twice now. Um, I didn't have a good choice in men. I really just, I when I look back at my younger 20 year old self, she didn't know anything, so that was okay. But also I wasn't taught anything by my family, you know, how to have, uh, you know, how to have value in yourself. I wasn't taught that. But also I was taught that my value was based on my looks, right? right. So I was taught from a very early age that, um, you know, if you look good, then you're going to get on far in life. If so, then I took that on board. And then also I never matched up to the supermodels. Do you remember Cindy Crawford mm. and Naomi Campbell? So, you know, there was this kind of inner angst all the time. I was never happy. I remember going to my first psychotherapist when I was about 25, just going, I want to be happy. Um, and so I've been on that quest since then. But then as I hit my 30s and came out my first divorce, I became a cocaine addict. I became an alcoholic. I bumbled from one abusive uh, relationship to another. Um, and at the time I was, um, I'm trying to think what I was. I, I was using drugs and alcohol, but I was um, also highly successful in my career. Like I'd opened up a Pilates studio. I had a wealth experience for the fitness industry. I opened a Pilates studio. I opened up one of the te- uh, UK's first pole of dancing academies. So I became like this showgirl. I was running events. So on one side, it was amazing and it was really flamboyant and gregarious and I was out there. But on the other side, underneath, I was just really unhappy and I was just destroying myself because one I was working too hard because I picked up that again that's another sort of script that women pick up that we've just got to do everything we have to do everything ourselves we can't ask for support if you ask for anything then you're weak um and it just so I did everything and one of the consequences from my 30s was that I went bankrupt I had to declare myself bankrupt I think I'm trying to think when it was maybe maybe it was two around 2006 2008 I had to declare myself bankrupt um because I was re- irresponsible with money so again another consequence of me never being taught my value or how to be an adult um which is a lot for the work that I do I teach women how to mature how to be an adult because especially at midlife like we are having to leave the girl behind and really step into our womanhood our crone age um, and we there's no room for being I might want to call it a princess there's no room for being a princess you can't throw tantrums you can't shut down you can't storm out the, ro- the room when someone's upset you um you can't uh, spend your money willy-nilly you have to take responsibility for your actions and you have to take a really beautiful honest look at how you're showing up um and so I was completely irresponsible with money and um 
I was when I was married. So that was my twenties. I was with the guy, uh, my first husband. I he con- kind of controlled me, but I just I don't think anyone really can control me. But I wasn't allowed to spend a lot of money on what I wanted, which was quite good in a way. We still had a great life. We travelled. We saved money. But as I hit my thirties and I got divorced, I was like, "Fuck you." and I just went crazy and I just went I'm going to do what I want when I want so it was like think about it like dieting so yeah. when we restrict we're like oh my god I'm, I'm gonna um it's restrict, restrict, restrict. And eventually that restriction gets so tight the bad steps and then we just eat everything that's what I was like with money as I hit my 30s I'm gonna buy this I'm gonna go on holiday I'm gonna get the designer goods I'm gonna do everything so I was still really wrapped up in my ego and so my ego was um like that you have to look good you have to have this kind of the facade of you've got it all together um so I just spent money all the time I was earning a shit ton but I spent more than a shit ton because when I would declare as a bank I think the figure I would I couldn't I I'd accumulated in debt was 78,000 right Make seventy-eight thousand pounds. Yeah, that was a lot of money. So that was the start of my downfall. <laughs> of I go um, because around two thousand and eight, I also uh, realised after various things, I just was like, "You're doing drugs. You're out. You're drinking alcohol." Um, you, I had my I had a nose job done, and I was sniffing cocaine up a freshly. Uh, new nose I was like I don't know what you're doing plus I had a son I was a single mom I was like sort your shit out and in 2008 that's when I started to start the process of unraveling mm-hmm. um and it's ever been ever since then. So what we in now 2022 what we in? how long how many years is that that's 14 years 14 years yeah oh my god yeah so I've been on this journey to come back to me to learn more about me like that's one of my things I've always been intrigued in how things work and I'm I'm an observer I will observe myself I will observe I remember going to your house once right and I couldn't believe like I think the persona was that you was this and it's wrong this is a wrong this is a wrong perception right okay so I I, this this is why I was shocked because I'm it's not a bad it's not good on me to think like this but you assume the stiletto wearing um bikini jingle jangling with d- d- dissily bits and feather boas is not intelligent that's a really bad perception and I went to your house and you cooked dinner and it was exquisite it was very very well cooked it wasn't um you know like beans on toast something that like I would do and then I went into your front room and there were books and books and books and these weren't just like your average books these were like like quite extensive like psychology kind of books it was before, just before you started doing your like your psychology studying and stuff and you were saying like how fascinated you were on it and I saw this whole other side to you open up and I I badly had the wrong impression that you you wasn't that way inclined it was all about the feather boas and the, the, the pole to dance on um and yeah I, I saw this other side to you come out and but what at what point did you sort of say to yourself I I like this version of who I am is is I'm more than this like when did you realize that it wasn't it it, that I don't think that that wasn't the language it wasn't I'm more than this it was um the god what a question it was I realized it was when I hit 40 um and I realized I kept doing the same things over and over again and I and it was like something uh, something has to shift and, and what I done so like in you know that persona that you picked up on me that's you know it's okay I don't I don't get uh concerned about that because that's what no there's no judgment well. like, anyone that's like you know no judgment at all I'm just being very honest we have to have honest conversations to get you know shifts and changes yeah, definitely but it's like um I'd always been kind of curious like like, like why am I doing this why am I doing it? why do I keep doing it and what got it to a crux was because I was still obsessed about how I looked right I was right. still obsessed about how I looked so when I stopped using cocaine in 2008 I swapped one obsession for another or one addiction to another and then I went into bodybuilding and I spent yeah. a year I, had, I hadn't been in the gym for 10 years and 
I went back into the gym within a year. I was on the British stage and I came to the UK. Yeah, I remember the pictures. You looked incredible. It was. It was like an incredible feat of what you can do. But that messed me up even more. Like it really messed my mind up. I started purging again. My eating disorders came back. And then I just was, I just remember it took me about five or six years to get myself unwound from that. But I just remember I kept going on these clean eating uh, programs, diets, and then losing weight because that's what I thought was important and then putting it back on. And I, I don't know what it was, but it was at some point I just went, you just keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. And I was reading all these books about these women that, set, that had this sense of freedom about them, that had this sense of liberation about who they were. They weren't that concerned about, you know, my body, there was more to life. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. I could not figure out how to get there. And this mm. is what I teach onto my clients. But what I said was, I've learned how to destroy my life. I, there must be another way I can learn how to create my life. I don't know how, but I'm just going to keep my mind open to yeah. what's coming and how to do it and the thought was I either put myself back into therapy to sort this shit out or I go and train as a side therapist so I was like right I'm gonna put myself back and I, I remember I didn't have any money I was living on the bread line this is we were talking about this time as well yeah because we I, I remember talking to you about my money and I was just like oh my what, what can I do and but I just worked a bit harder and, and that's the thing is this world of love and light, fairy unicorns, manifestation, uh, just think and you'll get rich. It's all bullshit because at the end of the day, what we miss out is the hard graft that we all have to put in if we want to change stuff. Because that it has not been an easy ride to get me here and it's still not an easy ride because it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And most people are so brainwashed that if you just think think amazing thoughts then everything's going to come to you and you'll change and it doesn't work like that it's actually you we this there's so much more depth we have to unpick our conditioning we have to really go back into how we were in child how the child how our childhood like we were grew up the environment we live in we live in a patriarchal society i'm watching bridgerton at the moment right so bridgerton yeah. was only i don't know if you watched it but, but it yeah. was set in 18 20s right that's not lot that long ago not and really. the way that they talk about women is still in our genetic coding it's still in our dna so we're still having to battle that right so the thing is it's a lot of free finding yourself changing yourself is about questioning your conditioning you have to question your condition and you have to do, choose to do it another way and then as you question your conditioning, you're going to come up against, oh my God, here's some stuff I need to heal. A lot of my clients, it's a lot of childhood wounding. We, unless you've had a beautiful childhood with an unconditional love, most people are going to have some kind of childhood wounding. And then probably when you get to my age, I'm in my 50s, you're going to have some kind of life trauma as well. And so you've got to heal from that. Um, and then that kind of sets you up to live more aligned with who you are. But, but they're not quick fixes because you've described some of this, like, you know, it took you six, year, six years from doing the bodybuilding stuff to sort of unravel from that. And you've described other periods where you're talking, you know, the last 14 years I'm picking this process. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about uh, something you're consciously aware of that you are yep. work actively working on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah. because I know you're very self-aware like and you're very verbally self-aware so most mm -hmm. people are very self-aware but I say it all in my head you're like you, you'll be doing the live and you, you'll be telling everyone how you're feeling at that moment you're very uh, open book about what's going on with you how you're feeling what's going on um, but for most people that aren't on a, any sort of personal journey or just too busy running their business and kids and everything else yeah. they don't have the time to be asking themselves questions they don't have the the, the the I don't know that not not saying that they have, they're not capable of it but they haven't given the space or the time to do it and for me that I am very self-aware and I can sort of analyze where I'm at but um equally I can get busy get distracted but I'm not at a point where um I, I still there's still probably patterns that I'm doing Mm -hmm. that I know if I look at it if I think this out loud right now there are things that I have been doing over the last 10 years in my business where I am getting the same sort of results and you know 
I could probably say the same thing. Okay, well, I'm, I'm getting the same results here. What what should I be changing? But it takes it. I mean, not to the extreme of like you know, new new brand new nose and smoke, you know, having cocaine up it. But to the extent of where I'm going, well, why am I achieving what I want to achieve? Why aren't I getting where I want to get to um, as quickly as I want to? And I think that can be you know a, for anybody. So how do people listening? Yeah. How do you deal deal with that? Okay, so. The first thing, so the first thing is that you hold space for that. So if you were in session with me, I hold space for it. So it, it gets to be landed between two people so you get heard. And then it's a process. And so first of all, I would question, I would get, I would get, and so there's a process, there's a method to my madness. So at the top level, there's this, you have to work on your conditioning, then it's the healing, then it's the alignment, right? But then in that, I call them my seven superpowers. And no, my work is not a quick fix and quick fixes don't work. You and I both know that. And the thing is, I'm the antithesis of a quick fix and I don't market anything to be quick. But what I can do is sow seeds into people and, you know, like some clients work with me every single week, like they're long term clients, most clients, they come in for three to six months, and then they go out. But I know what I'm doing is I'm sowing seeds into them that are going to bloom when the time is right. So the, the seven superpowers is one is awareness, right? So you say like, I'm super aware, but it's awareness is the top layer. So we, we've got to start becoming aware of everything. And then in within these superpowers that you're going to apply the three things you're going to uh, decondition you're going to heal and then you're going to work on alignment in each of these seven superpowers and this is not linear because we've been taught everything is linear i just do a i just do this course so i'm get to, going to get to z or i'm just going to sign up with this amazing woman online and she's going to get me here and it's not like in therapy they taught me a long time ago is that I get to walk and the honor of walking alongside a client for a certain period of time. And that's what I'm doing. I'm walking alongside you for a small snippet of your life. And if I can impart wisdom and get you to look at life differently, then I know I've done a great job. I know I've done a great job. But the thing is, it's awareness. But here's the here's where the conditions start to come in, because most of us are still carrying around that heavy inner critic where we berate ourselves, where we pull ourselves down, where we don't think we've done enough. So then it's this gentle awareness of, oh, I'm being really hard on myself. And you're going to learn how to be kind to yourself. So there's this learning of kindness, there's this learning of compassion, which is what you see in me. You see a softer version of me now. I'm not so ferocious. I can be fierce, but I'm still learning how to soften my edges all the time. Mm. So I'll give you an example of how this played out in my life last year i taught myself how not to be an alcoholic i don't think i've ever i've never met anyone else who's done this but i knew i still wanted to drink and i went to AA, and aa says that you're powerless i drink i know I'm, I'm not powerless 2015 i came here where i am now in turkey and i taught myself how to uh, not be an alcoholic and so i unpicked everything now um I learned that I can't drink. I used to drink as, as to numb out. And so you could say it's willpower. You could say it's determination. You could say it's resolve. And I have a lot of that. But also, this is learn. I've learned how to be like this. You don't, you don't mature just because you grow up into an alcoholic system, but it's the way that you treat yourself. So last year, what I found was I was drinking again. I was drinking every single night because I was having a really good year in my business. I was earning a lot of money. I thought this was success. You know, this is it. Oh my God. So I was drinking every, every night. So instead of beating myself up, and going, oh my God, I have to stop drinking. That voice was still in there. So using my superpowers is one, I've started to become aware. Two, I apply the gentleness to it. Okay, that's fine. You're drinking. I get it. You're drinking because you're happy. You're drinking because you're tired. That's fine. So in the morning when I started to have a go at myself, I was like, no, you made a choice because there's in the superpowers, honesty as well. So there's other superpowers, honesty. You choose to have a drink. 
then don't beat yourself up just get on with your day so this is a learned behavior so you're learning how to be with yourself more compassionately not having mm -hmm. to go yourself so i've heard you've said this i've spent time with you like on and off i've heard you say this before to me like i'm not where i am and there needs to be more so for me it sounds like that's conditioning it sounds like you're beating oh. yourself up because when we always think we have to be somewhere else mm. and i need to have more i need to do more i need to be more successful then where we are looks very shoddy it's like oh this is not enough and so for me i also went through this this year um at the beginning of the year i invested heavily in a coach and it all went wrong and uh i learned a lot through my mistakes that's part kind of my design and so for me it was like oh i'm not there so when we're not there here is not right so the thing is it's like okay i want to be somewhere else that's interesting why do i want that so it's un it's really unpicking why you want it where mm. the conditioning is and yeah this is going to take time but the thing is that uh, I, you know do you want to spend your life spinning around being unhappy with what you've got or do you want to actually figure out how to be with yourself more harmoniously and create a peaceful relationship with yourself? I know yeah. which one I'm going to choose. Yeah, so right. for me, it would be unpicking the conditioning of what makes me think there is more out there that doesn't mean... But social media don't... plays a part in that as well, because we see other people doing whatever online and there's a it's couple of bullshit. Facebook... Yeah, but it's, it's a couple of Facebook groups. And there are, there, to be fair, these are people that I think are genuinely earning a lot of money. Yeah. And they haven't felt that, they, that the environment has been right to share that kind of wealth. Because, you know, we've been taught as women that we shouldn't sort of show off and we should be meek and we should be mild and we should be compassionate and we all the rest of it. And so that they, these, these particular groups are for women to say, oh, hey, look at what I'm achieving. This is amazing. Now, I'm not triggered by their results. Um, but I, I do get a little bit, I find it a bit crass, if I'm honest, like this sort of, um, and there's also a strategy, there's a marketing strategy behind it, which is all about the, this sort of power um, element, well, I want what they want, therefore, if I go and follow them, or I go and buy their program, I'll have the same, I'll, I'll earn the same, the same as them. Yeah. Um, and that's where some of yeah. my conditioning comes from. I think that almost like current society is, is thought my brain well if she's doing that i can go and do that yeah oh, that's understandable but also online there is a whole shady side to coaching which is becoming more and more apparent and a lot of that coaching is like mlm right so yeah. it's more high level marketing because someone at the top is telling them they're earning 40 40 million this year already um just sign up and you can do the same and so what's happened right at the beginning the ones at the top yeah they're going to be earning but what's happening over a period of time because the coaching industry is getting saturated is there's going to be less and less money but the ones at the top are going to keep getting the money right yeah so for, for me i would again question the coaching industry find out people who are calling out the truth find out people who are calling out bullshit spend mm. more time with them rather than just staying in the groups that people are just boasting around look i've got no problem about boasting around money but for me no. it's not i don't i don't feel the need to boast about how much money i'm earning it's immaterial it's, yeah it's just immaterial yeah and the thing is in business that's the thing that's going to get people to earn 10k i mean how many people invite me to their 10k month groups i'm like i'm not fucking interested fuck off you yeah know? but the thing is i don't hang around with that because when i was in there it put me into a place of lack like what i was doing was not enough yeah. so for me i extract myself out i mute the groups or come out of them completely and i know that i have when i get into that comparison world yeah i know i have to come back in put my blinkers on come back into my world and ask myself the question what do you want what's right for you exactly that exactly that right yeah. so uh, and then when you extract yourself from i need to be there in the, the the most powerful thing we can all do is place ourselves right where we are and go this is where i am this is not every this is not everything that i thought it would be mm. but it actually it's pretty damn good i've done really well and it's like i'm going to really appreciate this and that's the slowing down like the superpower of slowing down be more deliberate with your pace rather than just keep going 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 yeah, going yeah, yeah. never see what you've done that's what a lot of women do as well 
is especially the women I work with, they just they just kept going all the time. Yeah. Like this hustle mentality, lean in, keep going. I'm like, no, lean fucking back. And then yeah, lean, lean back out. some more. And lean I find that really interesting. Because it's almost energetically, the more you push for something, and I use the word yes. push, yes, actually, the more you can push it away. So that that's the only woo-woo I'll get with money from an energetic perspective. Yeah. Because it doesn't just land in your lap, but because your thoughts is what you manifest in your reality. So if you're pushing and like it's striving, not, no, 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 it's not, it's no, it's not that, it's not that. No, right? it's not your thoughts. No, it's not your thoughts create reality. It's too simple. It's no, and it's bullshit, right? It's reality is going to fucking happen. It's chaotic. It is unpredictable. Life is uncertain. We, to think that we can predict life. No. It's ridiculous. We're not gods, right? So no, that is not true. It is untrue that we can predict our reality. But the thing is, life is going to happen with or without you. Yeah. Life is going to happen around you all the time. What we can control is how we react to reality. To it. Yeah. Right? So reality is going, reality is already happening. We are yeah. not fucking manifesting fucking reality. <laughs> Fuck off. It is, it, we're not that powerful, right? We're not that powerful. Because the thing is, if we could manifest a reality, then let's all let go over to India and let's make sure everyone is fed, watered, got houses. Right? Yeah. Can you see where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah. Let's go over to America and get rid of all the guns. Let's yeah. manifest that shit. No, yeah. it doesn't happen. No, no, right? no, no, Life no. Is, is bigger than us. But what we do have control of, and this is where our power is, is how we respond to, to it. life. But I think yes. control is quite a big part of that. We're, we're taught to almost try and control so much. And so controlling the reality and controlling other people and controlling outcomes is just like, that's part of our society. Right. Okay. So this is another really good one because I was an absolute control freak and an absolute perfectionist, all or nothing, I used to say. So I was all or nothing. And that's what I was like with money. I either spent it or I saved it. I spent it or I saved it. Or I either eat or I didn't eat. Um, and the thing is, these are all the labels that we give ourselves. It's worth unpicking all the labels and then becoming to a neutral place. The reason why we will go out and control things around us. Maybe it's money, maybe it's our body, maybe it's our family, maybe it's our emotions, is because ultimately we do not feel safe within ourselves. So this is a huge part of my work and this has been a huge part of my own personal journey is creating safety within myself. So then, and I was talking to you before we hit record, is like I can now travel and I'm learning how to travel and become a nomadic. Anywhere I go becomes home because I'm the home. Yeah. I'm the but that's home. really powerful though, right? Yes. Again, and again, in society, we're taught that you have bricks and mortar and you have a home and your home is basically you know, your door key and you walk in and mm. you, you, I still see people buying their first houses, young girls in their 20s. And they're so proud of how they've got, they've got a job, they've gone to university, they've bought the house and, you know, rightfully they're proud. But we're in a society where that's become the norm and yes. we then strived for it. Definitely. And do you know what I noticed? Because my second husband was American. They're not like that as much. Right. So they move around a lot more because the country is so much bigger, but they don't have it's the UK mentality of you grow up, you you get married, you buy a house. And it's still I don't give a shit. 2022, it's still there. We're still in that marriage constitution where this freaks me out, right? The man gives the work the girl away to the the uh the new husband. I'm like, freaks me out. So if I go back to Bridgerton, still stuff from the 1830s, 1820s, still playing out now. This is why I say you have to not everyone's gonna want to do this work though, right? No, some people no. are really gonna be some people are going to be really happy living within the box environment, the the matrix, you know, but I've never been like that. I'm like this huge character that wants to explore, that likes freedom. So hence, I challenge 
very gently, I challenge all the rules. It's not like I'm going down trampling things. I'm just questioning things. Does this work for me? How do I want this to work for me? Um, and that's, if I swing this back to money, like the whole process around my money story was I questioned everything and I looked how I treat money and I treated money like a toxic relationship. I didn't respect it. I didn't love it. And so the way that I changed everything, and it's, it's taken such a long time and it's still now, you know, I'm, it's, I learned, I create money as my lover. Like, and it's a lover I want to keep around and I have to take really good care of it. But also, again, I'm challenging the notion of I should be further ahead with my money. I shouldn't yeah. have this. I should be able to do this. So it's challenging all of that and come and blocking it out and coming back into like what's right for you. What's right for you. And what I what come up for me as you was talking is um, when I hear people, uh, women, I should say, and, it, and this is part of our... Um, you know, what we've been brought up to think is that we've been taught as women that our needs are way down the pecking order. And therefore, you know, some of the questions that you ask, what do I need? What do I want? I think mm-hmm. for me, and I'm sure for other women, we, we, we're we not taught to think like that. We're actually no. taught to go, well, how, look after everybody else's needs. And then you look after mm-hmm. yourself. Um, and I, I must admit, I've, I've turned, I'm 42 this year um so once once I turned not quite 39 but definitely when I turned 40 I felt this massive shift towards actually what it is I want and I just I can just imagine by the time I do get to 50 and I'm more slightly more middle-aged I think that I I just I could just imagine me going no I don't I'm not doing that that doesn't suit me because what happens as well, right? So again, I, I know I keep bringing Bridget in, but I'm watching it at the moment. And it's really getting me to think. The thing is, again, we're still taking on. When you watch all these girls, they're different debutantes, and they go out to find them. They're groomed to be this perfect uh, woman or girl. It's only sixteen, so the man will marry them, right? That's still in us. The other thing as well. Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, I think it's gone from my head. It's. But, it's like it, you have to challenge that conditioning the other thing that's it as well is we have estrogen well you have estrogen running around your system estrogen is the hormone that wants you to make sure it's the nurturing hormone right it's the one that when your baby sucks your, your nipple breastfeeding it's like you get all this lovey-dovey so when you have estrogen seeping around your system you are set up to make sure everyone is okay and you don't want everyone to be upset plus if you were taught earlier on that to be a good girl and a people pleaser put that with estrogen and it's going to magnify what happens what i'm finding is as estrogen leaves your body and menopause perimenopause you you stop Give it a like, shit. Give it a shit. That's why, you know, like a minute ago, um, there was a woman, I think she must be late 60s. She's Turkish, but she knows me because I've been coming here for ages. She literally says, I've come off a plane. I've been on 19 hours. I can't get to my apartment. Can I come in, use your toilet? And I can you get me a glass of water? And I'm like, oh my God. Okay, like, then. Not, yeah, I'm like, she just doesn't give a shit. But could you imagine like a 22 year old saying that? You know, be like, oh, I'm really sorry. I can't really need to borrow your toilet. I'm, I'm really so struggling. sorry. <laughs> No. <laughs> it was so funny. If I, if I would have come come across somebody like that probably about four or five years ago, my instant th- thought process would be, well, they're selfish. How selfish are they? How 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 selfish are they? And also around like, oh my god, their ego must be so fucking big that they can go around sort of like putting demands on everybody all the time because they're so freaking special. That would be my first. Now, if I met someone like that, I'd be like, oh my god, I want to be more like that. <laughs> yes, because yeah. it's not about being so selfish. I always say, well, here's again, again, you have a word we've it's been loaded with meaning from your conditioning and the way that you've grown up unpack it unpack that meaning and then give it your own meaning because I was taught I was said I was always been selfish because I've always done what I wanted to do and so I and it's like actually I'm really glad I was selfish because I've lived the life it's been a you know a flamboyant lifestyle but I've always done what I do and now it's set me up to do more of that as I'm getting older so you know our society says you're getting older it's all game over but now I'm like no I'm going off into my next stage so unpack the labels give them your own meaning so then when someone does come along and say you're selfish you go yeah actually I am selfish 
and so it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't have the same like, connotation no. we talk about yeah. that about money that like you should have the same emotional feeling you have opening your bank balance online or thinking about your own personal money cash flow that the, the reaction that you have should be exactly the same as the pen that I've got in my hand like you should really like have no emotional attachment to it um but money does create a lot of opportunities it calls, creates a lot of sorrow mm. if you haven't got it it's all well and yep. good like feeling like that when you're in a normal status quo but for people for example that maybe over the next sort of six months if we do go into a sort of a full uk recession um that actually there's a mass massive amount of emotional connection to it and self-worth yeah, yeah definitely like I, I i understand where you're going and i can completely understand that because i'm on the flip side where i've got money in the bag but i've also spent six to eight years where i didn't have anything and the trauma that still lives in my body now from that experience is something i have to very gently manage as i move through life and i i get it money you could say money is neutral but the thing is that we you can't do anything in life when you haven't got any money you cannot do anything so we all need money so of course it's going to be loaded so maybe it's like it is loaded and it's just again learning how to manage ourselves and i think as well there's a maturity that we all need to have around money i mean i'm a great example of being immature with money and just getting myself in such dire straits with it so it may be in schools instead of teaching like fractions and, and algebra would actually talk money management wouldn't that be cool that'd be it would so be. It'd be so it would be so much more powerful and so, so for us wrapping up I'd love to hear a little bit about what you've got planned next so you've sort of had this phase of life where you know you've described your last 14 years and unraveling that and you've started to now find yourself and you're back in Turkey as you're talking to us today so mm. what's next for you so what's next is that um so I'm I'm here in Turkey for two months and then I come back into the UK and so what I'm learning because I went traveling last year is I don't want to spend too much time in the UK because I get back into that the it's the um, my comfort it's comfortable but it's uncomfortable oh I'm in my house everything's here so I'm back in and I'm going to go to the states quickly um I um I'm writing my book my memoirs and my ghost writer is harold robin's wife or widow he's passed away now so i'm going to go and meet her and spend some time about talking about my book um and then i'll come back to turkey and then i'm going to go back home rent my look after my son my son's 22 home you said uk home yeah back to the uk okay. interesting <laughs> see there you go so back to the UK, back to my home and rent it out. So I'll take right. good care of my son, make sure he's all right, rent my house out. And then I'll probably, I'll probably end up east way. I don't know, you know, I'm just open. I haven't, I, part of my brain wants to like plan it all. Right. Like really plan it all. But I'm like, no, nah, just leave it. The next step is going to come. Something will show up. So I don't know where I'm going to be, but I know I'll end up back in Turkey. Um, and then I'm just pulling the um, like making the decision to um hire a pr what wonderful pr woman and then she's going to work on my pr for the next six to 12 months and just push, push me out into the uk audience a bit more because i want to grow i i know now that what i've got to say is of value and i yeah. can change lives and it's like in me i need to be out there a little bit more i'm not looking for stardom or anything so i can see this vision where i'm standing on stage talking to a lot of women yeah um and so who knows what's coming but becoming nomadic is my next thing and then finishing the book the uh, online i mean there's always opportunities to work with me privately private retreats and then my membership opens the doors every now and then um, i'm very much focused on midlife that's my niche uh, so midlife women who want to live a different way you know they want to come out of the box they're my kind of women um but for me yeah there's lots of changes so, it sounds so exciting, exciting. And scary. Yeah. Yeah, but how brave of you to sort of embrace that and on your own and you haven't got to do it with anyone else's help or nope. with a man or anything else in between. It's 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 all on your on you and you can do it and it's all all good. Yeah. I I would love I loved having our chat today and I I know that we could talk for so much longer about these subjects. Um so you have to come back maybe in a few months' time once you're uh, done some more travelling and 
I can't wait cool. to hear about your book. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be a good time to come back, wouldn't it? Yeah, you can come back then. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and a little bit about yourself. And you can get in touch with Star Munro on the details that are in the bio below. Um, if you're listening or you're online. Um, so go and check her out. I love watching her Instagram or Facebook stories. Every day she's on there. And recently you have to go and find the stories about her teeth, um, which is always something going on with Star. Uh, which are highly hilarious and stopping herself from buying more shoes and more sunglasses I do like a sunglass I do like a like, nice pair of sunglasses and I think there was one week where all I saw was you basically parading in shops with handbags taking pictures in shops turkey turkey <laughs> I'm gonna do it again I'm not had a break I'm gonna go back handbag shopping that's what I love it for. You are, you are like my muse of something that I, I aspire to be. I hope one day I hope to be sitting around drinking beers in Turkey and, and that's my life uh, right now. Um, not right the case, but hey, we can all aspire, right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.